When I first started researching into the history of Rock County, I was shocked to stumble upon this article from the Milwaukee Sentinel from 1921, titled, Murder Rampant in Early History of Rock County. Now, while I had always heard rumors about the dark and sometimes supposedly even supernatural underbelly of this southern Wisconsin county, obviously, that wasn't what I expected to find. But it did lead me down a very disturbing rabbit hole. So relax, sit back, and enjoy as I take you through the era of violence and the homicides that made Rock County. First, let's talk about Rock County as it is today. Located at the lowest point of central Wisconsin, Rock County is right on the state line with Illinois. While an accurate census is hard to come by, the county boasts at least 160,000 citizens according to the most recently available census results. Some cities in the county include Janesville, Beloit, Evansville, and Milton. It boasts 18 parks, 23 lakes, and four trails. Rock County was first settled in 1835, with the first houses built by William and Joshua Holmes, John Inman, and George Falmer, near the area that would become Janesville. Around the same time, fur trader Joseph Tybalt built a home for his family nearer the state line in what would someday become Beloit. Joseph Tybalt, also known to some as Old Joe, was described as quite tall, slender, and honest. He was a fur trader in what would become the Beloit area. He had two wives, one who was considerably older, and one who was younger, usually said to be around 30, and very attractive. Her name was Lysette Lassillier. She was half Ho-Chunk and half French. He also had several sons, but the most important of which is Frank. Joseph Tybalt spoke English, French, and three other Indian languages. In the spring of 1836, he conveyed his squatter's claim to a vast amount of land along Turtle Creek and east of the Rock River for about $500 to Caleb Blodgett, who represents the New England Immigrating Company. Tybalt would stay in the area for another year before selling his cabin to Robert Crane and Otis Bicknell, who also helped establish the new pioneer town called Turtle. After leaving the area, Tybalt would move his family up to Lake Koshkanog to the north and settle on the southeasterly shore of the lake. He would build two log cabins there. One he would turn into a trading post for Native Americans. This was about a mile and a half north of the mouth of the lake. And this area is apparently, still to this day, called Tybalt's Point. In late December 1838, Joseph Tybalt would disappear, never to be seen again. It seems it's rather hard to pin down exactly when Joseph Tybalt disappeared, as his son, Frank, seemed to hide the disappearance for several weeks before reporting it to anyone. A diary entry by Lucian Caswell, one of Joseph Tybalt's friends, says... In the winter of 1839 or 1840, the old gentleman disappeared, which fact was not made known by Frank for several weeks, till finally he came to our house and told us his father had been missing for some time, giving no intelligent story about the disappearance. Suspicion at once rested upon both the young people, and extensive search was made for some trace of foul play. Persons came from a great distance and examined the surrounding thickets and the ash of the lake and tried to discover, if possible, any hole cut in the ice where his body might have been put through the lake, but without success and the search was finally abandoned. In another entry in his diary, Lucian writes, Unfortunately, however, he had a reckless grown-up son named Frank, who gave him no small amount of trouble. Frank and the younger wife were greatly attached to each other. Speculation quickly circulated that Frank and Lysette had murdered Joseph Tybalt, and yet, as no body could be found and no proof of foul play ever existed, there was no way to charge them for the crime. In the spring of 1940, Frank would gather up supplies and move the family out of the area. With the primary suspects gone, everyone thought that this would be the last anyone would hear of the Joseph Tybalt disappearance, and effectively, the case went cold. It would be nearly a hundred years before more light would be publicly shed on the disappearance of Joseph Tybalt. Apparently, later in his life, Lucian Caswell would write more about the topic, revealing secrets that only he knew. In 1936, his daughter, Miss Elizabeth Perry, would release the information to the public. These new documents by Lucian reveal the truth of the matter and read as follows. The country was greatly aroused. Far and near people came from a great distance to aid in the search for his body, for little doubt existed as to his fate. No real discovery, however, was made that pointed to a rational conclusion. There was one story told some months afterwards by a small boy by the name of Levick, who lived at the time with the family. He stated that Frank and the young wife wanted to move away and go among the Indians west of the Mississippi River, while the old people did not want to go, though the old lady was willing to go if the others concluded to. That one evening, they made the boy go to bed quite early. He did not go to sleep, but kept an eye out, for he was afraid something unusual was contemplated. That about midnight, they threw a blanket over the boy's head, supposing he was asleep. He removed the blanket till he could see what they were doing, and he saw them strike the old man with a hatchet several blows, till apparently he was dead. Then they carried him out, and that was the last he saw of the body. 
To corroborate with his story, the bones of the man were finally found in the thicket a half a mile from the house on the border of the marsh. No arrests, however, were made, and the crime dropped out of mind. That's the story how one of the founding settlers of Rock County became the first person associated with the area to be murdered. Now let's turn our attention back to what was actually happening in Rock County. After it was settled in 1835, the first settler death in the area would come only one year later. The wife of Samuel St. John, which was regarded as one of the first families to ever settle in the area, would die in 1836, only a year after their arrival. Nearly 20 years later, only a few months after the fire department was organized, the first murder in Rock County would take place. A Janesville Daily Gazette article from 1930, marking the 75-year anniversary of the slaying, described this first murder, saying, Despite several notorious crimes committed in this vicinity since that time, the Augur killing remains one of the most revolting, and its result stands alone as the only case in which a mob has taken the law into its own hands in Rock County. In the 1850s, Andrew Augur was a lumberman who lived in the Johnson Creek area with his family. In early summer of 1855, he came downriver to Beloit where he sold his haul of logs for $600 and a horse and buggy. He cashed his check with Dr. Sanderson at the Beloit Bank, and with his new rig and several hundred dollars in his pocket, he set off for home. Unfortunately for him, David F. Mayberry, an ex-convict, was in Beloit at the same time as Auger, and somehow learned that the lumberman had several hundred dollars on his person. Mayberry asked Auger if he could ride with him at least as far as Janesville, and Auger obliged. Despite Mayberry already having planned to kill and rob Andrew Auger, he didn't actually have a weapon to do it with. So when they arrived at the city, they split up for a brief time for supplies before setting off again. While separated, almost immediately, Mayberry entered a hardware store to purchase a hatchet. Emery Nash, who worked at the hardware store, would recall at the trial that Mayberry spent a lot of time selecting a hatchet, and kept remarking that they were all too large. Not suspecting any evil intentions, Andrew Auger set off again with Mayberry. As they were traveling through a dense piece of woods on the old Spalding farm, Mayberry stood up on the pretext of buttoning his coat and assaulted Auger with the hatchet, striking him in the head three times. Mayberry then began driving to a more secluded location to dump the body. Auger, however, was not dead. As they traveled, Auger apparently regained consciousness, though probably already fatally wounded, and begged for mercy, offering to divide the money he had on this person with Mayberry. But Mayberry responded by slashing his throat and stabbing him three more times in the side. He then took his papers and most of his clothing, and at about 6 p.m. drove away with the buggy, leaving the mutilated body of Andrew Auger hidden in Spalding Woods at the head of Milton Avenue. Mayberry returned to his home between Rockford and Beloit, where he proudly confessed the murder to his friend, John G. McComb. At this point, Mayberry had only been released from prison in Alton, Illinois, a year prior, where he had spent eight years for violent crimes. At the very first opportunity, McCombs sent word to the sheriff in Rockford of the crimes, and Mayberry was promptly arrested. Rockford officers then came to Janesville to assist the sheriff in finding the body of Andrew Auger, exactly where Mayberry had told McComb it would be. It had been nearly three weeks since the murder had taken place. Mayberry was brought to Janesville for trial, which angered many in Illinois, as Wisconsin had by this point abolished the death penalty. The court convened on July 9th at 8.20 a.m., with numerous witnesses being able to link Mayberry to the crime. On July 11th, at 6 p.m., the case was given to the jury, who returned within 20 minutes to announce their guilty verdict. Mayberry accepted the verdict quietly. But the next morning, when asked if he had any last words for the court before sentencing, Mayberry said, I know the evidence is strong against me, but I am innocent of the murder. Mayberry was sentenced to life imprisonment, with much of his time required by the judge to be spent specifically in solitary confinement. However, Mayberry would never live to again see a prison cell. As Mayberry was being escorted to the prison the same day as his sentencing, a mob would overtake the convoy and seize Mayberry. He was dragged by the mob, consisting of lumbermen and friends of Andrew Auger, to the upper part of the courthouse park near the intersection with Bluff Street, where David Mayberry was hung until dead. Citizens of Janesville reportedly refused to aid officers in stopping the mob and allowed the hanging to take place. The tree from which Mayberry was hanged was cut down the same day by one of the jurors who had convicted him of the murder, and the particular branch he was hung from was sent to the State Historical Museum. Within a day, the entire tree had been carried away as souvenirs. This was the first murder of a settler in Rock County, and it was nearly 15 years before the next murder of note occurs, and from there the rate of homicides in the area would quickly begin to ramp up. On April 29, 1869, William Duval is arrested for the murder of his wife, Elizabeth Moore. 
But to get the full story, we need to go back nearly a year to Duvall's first arrest for murder. Dr. William P. Duvall was a traveling doctor for many years, going from town to town claiming that he could cure anything from paralysis to cancer without the use of medicine or instruments. Being a bit of what one might call a snake oil salesman, or simply a quack doctor, Duvall was well versed in arriving in a town, tricking his way into some money, and then metaphorically getting out of Dodge before the town caught onto his lies. However, on November 3rd, 1868, Duvall set up shop in the house of his friend William A. Sterling in Owatonna, Minnesota, where he would carry out his practice for the next month. Duvall, however, would soon meet Elizabeth Moore, who, on the 23rd of November, only a few weeks after arriving in town, would become his fourth wife. On the night of their wedding, Sterling's house, where Duvall and his wife were staying, would be surrounded by a mob. It was debated at the time why the mob set their sights on Duvall, with some claiming it had to do with his unethical practices, and even some dismissing it as a group of Germans upset with an alcohol mix-up. While the slatter claim was likely just a racist scapegoating, the true case of the mob's assault would not be revealed for nearly a year. Regardless, the mob charged the house, and while attempting to break down the door, William Sterling opened fire, shooting and mortally wounding John Roche, a member of the mob. The police arrived shortly and took both Sterling and Duvall into custody. Both men were charged with assault, but by mid-December, Duvall had been released and continued his travels along with Elizabeth through Minnesota and later into Wisconsin. On April 29, 1869, William P. Duvall would be arrested for murdering his wife by way of poison at the boarding house where the Grand Hotel is now situated, where they were boarding. During his trial, William Sterling testified that Duvall had acted cruelly to Elizabeth during their courtship and brief married life in Awatama, and his behavior prompted 72 citizens to write a letter telling him to leave town. Duvall did not heed their warning, and the citizens of the town came to his house with the intent of tarring and feathering him the night after he married Moore. Ultimately, Duvall was convicted of murdering his wife, Elizabeth Moore, with strychnine, and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Within a year of Elizabeth Moore's murder, another homicide would occur in Rock County. Now, the setup could almost be mistaken as the plot of a Hallmark movie, right up until the gunshot is heard. Let me set the scene. We find ourselves in the comfy, cozy little township of Harmony in southern Wisconsin. The date is December 25th, Christmas, at nearly 3 a.m., and there's the softest blanket of snow across the ground. In a quaint little farmhouse, two voices could be heard, one soft and calm, and the other more emphatic. As we zoom in on the quiet little scene, a single gunshot shatters the calm air. A murder has been committed in harmony, and Humphrey Roberts is found dead in the dirt at Jenkins Farm. The murderer, a man referred to only as Stowe, is arrested and sentenced to life in prison. This is the second murder Rock County has seen this year. On July 4th, 1878, a farmhand named Joe Watsick, residing at the Mack Farms near Chopier in Rock County, is awoken by his roommate and fellow farmhand Frank Dickerson and asked to go out to feed the livestock. As he enters the barn, however, he's greeted with a horrific sight. His employer, George Mack, is lying dead and mutilated on the stable floor beneath the feet of his beloved horses. An examination of George's body would reveal that his chest was caved in, with one shoulder and three ribs badly fractured. He had an ugly gash upon the top of his head as though made with a sharp instrument, and his face was scratched up. It was reported that his head had been pounded into jelly. The second farmhand, Frank, was sent to Janesville to inform friends and family of George Mack of his passing, and asserting that he had been killed by Old Jen, a horse of George's that had a bad reputation. However, police would uncover evidence that indicated that this could only have been foul play. George Mack was described as a farmer in comfortable circumstances, respected by his neighbors, esteemed by the public, and without an enemy in the world. His family consisted of the deceased, his wife, three children, and two men, Frank Dickerson and Joe Watsick, who were assisting on the farm. George married his wife, Belinda Whitney Mack, in 1863 in Janesville, and reportedly proceeded to have a very rocky marriage until his death. Belinda was described as a dignified and agreeable woman who was aging well, with prominent features, dark eyes, and well-maintained dark hair. It was well rumored that Belinda and their farmhand Frank had developed an illicit relationship that George seemed to be well aware of. George soon confronted Frank, firing him and forcing him to leave the farm. However, soon after, George fell very ill, and while unable to stop her, Belinda proceeded to rehire Frank. Thus, the rumors of their affair grew even more. Frank Dickerson was 23 years old, large for his age, and had acquired a reputation for crookedness and cunning in the community. 
He was described as below medium height, florid complexion, red hair, short neck, and of stocky build. Many in the community were dumbfounded that Belinda could find love in such a man. Shortly, evidence was found in the pig pen that led investigators to believe the murder had occurred there and that George had been dragged to the barn to lay blame on the horses. As such, Frank Dickerson was arrested. After much pressure was put on Dickerson by the police, he finally admitted to his part in the murder. He claimed, however, to only be an accomplice in the homicide and that George's wife, Belinda, had struck the killing blow herself. He claimed she asked him to carry the body to the barn and make it look like it was the work of the horses. Belinda was arrested and soon convicted of the murder in Beloit on January 10, 1879, where she was sentenced to life in prison. Frank would be convicted of accessory to murder on May 15, 1879, and would also be sentenced to life in prison. This was not the end of the story, however. Only a few years later, Belinda appealed her case to the Wisconsin Supreme Court on the grounds that she was not allowed to testify as to her version of the prior relationship with her husband. The court agreed, and she was granted a new trial. This time, she would walk free with nearly half of the jury still believing she was guilty of manslaughter. Dickerson would be pardoned in 1891, but by this point, Belinda was already remarried to Joe Watsick, the teenage farm man who had found her husband's body. It was rumored by the press that this marriage was explicitly so that Watsick couldn't be compelled to testify against her in the second trial. Those same reports gleefully included that Belinda Mack had lost her good looks and that the strangely matched couple lived in poverty until their deaths. Only a year after the murder of George Mack, another slaying would take place on a farm in Rock County that also prominently featured a man named George. Only this time, George Baumgartner was the killer. On September 23, 1879, farmer Alex White would send his son, known as Little Sandy White, out to play in the woods surrounding the farm in Janesville. It was here that George Baumgartner, one of the farmhands, would take the young boy's life. While details of what exactly happened that day in the woods are vague, one article from the Kenosha Telegraph in 1879 would describe the murder as atrocious. Baumgartner was immediately arrested for the crime and taken into custody by Sheriff Comstock. On October 6th, after details of the horrific crime became known to the public, a mob arrived at the jail demanding that Baumgartner be handed over to them. However, Sheriff Comstock had heard of the mob's plans and had already quietly sent Baumgartner to a jail in Elkhorn where he would be convicted without facing mob justice. He would spend the rest of his life in prison for the murder of little Sandy White. On October 19th, 1879, another horrible murder was reported in the town of Milton, while details of this case are also limited, it was reported in the Kenosha Telegraph that the victim, Edward Fogarty, was a one-legged tin peddler. Evidence revealed that Fogarty had been murdered by his wife and a man named Henry Christensen. After beating the man to death, they carried his body to a clover field in a straw sack and proceeded to set the field ablaze, hoping to burn the body and dispose of any evidence of their crime. They failed, however, and were promptly charged with the murder. When pressed for a motive for the crime, Christensen claimed that he did kill Fogarty, but that it was in self-defense. Needless to say, claiming self-defense against a frail, one-legged man did not garner any sympathy or belief from the authorities. Christensen was sentenced to life imprisonment. One thing that shocked me about these past few crimes, beyond the recurring themes of wives killing their husbands, farmhands, and men named George, was that when looking at a list of all important events in Rock County, put together by the Janesville Fire Department in 1912, this entire chunk in 1979 is just murders. It's kind of shocking to see them all grouped together like this. From there, until the start of the 20th century, murders were just a regular occurrence, to the point where it stopped becoming sensational news and was just written off as another murder. Details are limited for a lot of these coming up, so I'll just speed through the rest until we hit 1900. On May 24th, 1884, Frank F. Punchin murders Augusta Luckow. No details given. July 16th, 1886, Henry Search and his wife were murdered in their farm home, just a few miles west of Janesville. Rumor spread of supernatural causes, as Henry supposedly claimed to have seen a frogman watching him at night, but many attribute this to the onset of dementia. No actual details exist about the murders, and no one was ever officially charged. On August 27th, 1892, Miss Daniel Stone is murdered in Fulton, and in December of that year, a man named Matthew R. Ashton is indicted. On February 3rd, 1894, he's sentenced to life in prison. However, within three weeks, he died in his cell of natural causes. On April 13th, 1893, Matthew Bitson killed his wife and a man named Arthur Hearn and tried to burn the house down to hide the evidence. He was arrested and pled guilty on December 11th, 1893. In 
And that takes us from the founding in 1835 to the early 1900s. Now, Rock County is a community known for growth and beauty. But for those of us who live here, we know we've never been far from a creepy story, be it supernatural or otherwise, about any location around. A county built on the back of so much violence and murder is bound to still hold all sorts of secrets, and I aim to find them. Make sure you like and subscribe so that you don't miss more content like this, and if you know anyone from Rock County that would find this interesting, make sure you share. Finally, if you have any rumors, stories, or creepy tales regarding the area or surrounding areas, feel free to comment or even message me directly. Until next time, thank you for watching, and keep exploring the darkness.